Tonight, beset by food shortages, North Korea still plays hardball. What is happening inside the Hermit Kingdom? We'll ask a top UN official who has just been there. North Korea's state of mind, you have to understand that it is still technically at war with the United States. It only ever signed an armistice, not a peace treaty, after the end of the Korean War. And indeed, the policy of the current leader, Kim Jong-il, is called Songun, the Army First. And that Army First policy continues. But North Korea says that it could return to the six-party talks in return for a peace treaty with the U.S. and an end to sanctions. But you heard our previous guest, the U.N.'s Lynn Pasco, say that he's not sure how serious they are about that. Joining me now, an expert on North Korea, Song Yoon Lee of Tufts University in Massachusetts. Mr. Lee, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you very much for having me. So what is it, when you look at North Korea, do you think that they really do want a certain reason for coming back or are they happy now to be a nuclear power? Are they in no hurry to get back to the, to the talks? Well, North Korea has been uh, insisting on a peace treaty with the United States uh, ever since North Korea joined the World Health Organization in the early 70s and opened an office at the UN mission. They have been persistently really consistently suing for a peace treaty. And yet, I've asked members, for instance, of the Bush administration, their North Korea point person, who said that, you know, we were bent over backwards to assure them of our peaceful intentions, to offer them peace treaty, to, to, we obviously took them off the terrorist list, and nothing was good enough. Well, what is a peace treaty? It is, after all, an agreement on paper. And I think historically, we've seen many cases of so-called non-aggression pacts, peace treaties not being entirely effective in the late 20s, there was uh, the Kellogg-Briand Pact signed by some 15 nations uh, that all went to war within the next 12 years or so. Uh, and then in the late 30s, of course, the pact between Hitler and Stalin. So North Korea has in mind, in asking for a peace treaty, uh, the goal of driving the U.S. troops stationed in South Korea out of the Korean Peninsula, which would tilt the balance of power uh, for the short term in North Korea's favor. Well, it doesn't seem likely that they're going to be able to achieve it, does it? Uh, I should hope not. Uh, we often hear that the war did not end with a formal peace treaty, the Korean War of 1950-53. Uh, I, I would also uh, remind our viewers that the North Korean revolution is still going on. They say this quite explicitly, that is, uh, to build a communist state in the entire Korean peninsula. And lest there should be any ambiguity, they do spell it out. They say that means roll back uh, U.S. imperialist forces from South Korea and end the U.S. colonial occupation of South Korea. Okay, so that's their sloganeering and it has been for, for decades. But what about a post-Kim Jong-il era? Has the United States, or South Korea for that matter, got any real contingency plan in place? There is a contingency plan in place and uh, that addresses sudden changes in North Korea, for instance, an insurrection or a humanitarian disaster or hostage situation for U.S. troops and South Korean troops to enter North Korean territory. But beyond that, I think we really should be seriously thinking about long-term prospects, planning for a post-Kim Jong-il future. If I were to suggest to you that we should be planning for uh, the collapse of Japan or uh, the United States in the wake of the end of the current administration, you might be formulating in your mind an exit strategy away from me perhaps, but North Korea is an inherently unstable country. Uh, it's on the precipice of economic collapse. You've called it a palace economy. Yes. I what have. does that mean? Well, there is a separate economy that feeds the ruling elite uh, apart from the general economy. And it is very vulnerable because it's so heavily reliant on illicit activities. Such as? The sales of, uh, well, missiles. Uh, and North Korea is very good at making those. And making money, right? And fake U.S. Uh, $100 bills and fake pharmaceuticals and drugs and so forth. Uh, otherwise, they really have nothing that's uh, marketable. Uh, they don't make any, uh, any goods, electronic goods, there's no tourism industry to speak of. So the existence of South Korea presents enormous problems for the North Korean regime. The fact that you have just across the border, South Korea, immeasurably richer, freer, to which most North Koreans would flee if given the opportunity. Uh, already 20,000 or so have at great risk. Now, you talk about a contingency plan in terms of an emergency. They'd obviously try to restrict 
as you say, the millions of refugees who would try to get into South Korea. But beyond that, what do you think it would take? You've mentioned uh, what General MacArthur told his aide in 1945 ahead of the U.S. occupation of Japan. Yes. What would it take in North Korea? Well, all those which were uh, basically dismantle the military, build up representative government, free political prisoners, allow freedom of the press and so forth. But it would take beyond that a lot of, uh, balance, of uh, balance of power politics. It would be impolite to perhaps go into it in detail. but. It would be very polite. <laughs> well, you know, um, Harold Macmillan, uh, the former British Prime Minister, when asked the question, you know, what drives national policy, he famously said, events, my boy, events. There will have to be some give and take uh, with China. When so you're talking about a place. massive reinvention of a, of, of a country. That's right. Because it has none of the infrastructure that even Japan did. Uh, well, North Korea has idle factories. North Korea is so unique in many ways. It is uh, an industrialized country, or it was, that took a massive great leap backward uh, in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union nearly 20 years ago. So North Korea is literate. Its population is highly educated and very disciplined. So those are some advantages. Yet North Korea lacks natural resources. Uh, there are certain uh, disadvantages to the North Korean economy that we must take into consideration. Let me ask you about right now, and you're talking about the economy. Uh, there are reports seeping out uh, that you've written about of, of some protests, people challenging the authorities, angry that they don't have enough food. Uh, Kim Jong-il, the leader, took the unprecedented step of apologizing uh, for not being able to provide his people a decent, uh, a decent standard of living. What is going on there? And is there really any significant challenge to the regime? Uh, we'll have to wait and see. North Korea is unique in this aspect as well. We have not had any open demonstrations in North Korea throughout the entire sweep of its political existence since the 1940s. There are no dissidents within the country. There are no famous activists. There are no uh, opposition uh, political parties or groups. So uh, what we are hearing that people have been actually sporadically protesting. They have been challenging the local authorities. This is uh, quite a significant development, I would say. Whether that leads to an imminent collapse or instability remains to be seen. Let me, uh, in terms of the political reality right now, I want to play you something that both President Obama and the South Korean president said when they were standing together uh, last year. Our message is clear. If North Korea is prepared to take concrete and irreversible steps to fulfill its obligations and eliminate its nuclear weapons program. The United States will support economic assistance and help promote its full integration into the community of nations. We agree to work closely together with the other countries in the six-party process to bring North Korea back to the six-party talks at an early date and make sure that North Korea takes substantive measures towards its denuclearization. Do you think it's going to take measures towards its denuclearization? It's a tremendously difficult task. There is the startlingly simple historical precedent that no nuclear weapons possessing state has ever, for any economic or political rewards, bargained away nuclear weapons without a regime change. Libya? Uh, had not gone nuclear quite yet. South Africa mm -hmm. and the former Soviet republics, uh, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Ukraine did, but in the wake of a regime collapse and new political will and opportunities to reorient themselves toward the international community. Well, you have said that you believe North Korea to be ripe for regime collapse. Uh, indeed, and if that were to take place, I think there would be certainly a window of opportunity. But why is it ripe in your view? Uh, Some people think it can just go on for, for a long time like this. Indeed. You know, in academia, this is very bizarre to me. The fact that North Korea went through hard times, a massive famine in the mid-90s and so forth, and the death of the founding dictator in 94, despite such uh, problems, that the fact that North Korea has survived uh, leads some people to believe, to assume that it will go on forever. But, you know, as hard as North Korea has tried in the past to tackle the uh, two uh, certainties in life, inev inevitabilities, taxes and death. For instance, North Korea calls its founding dictator eternal president. North Korea got rid of the income tax in 74. Uh, Kim Jong-il is mortal. His time will come to an end. On that note, Mr. Mr. Song Yun Lee, thank you so much indeed for joining thank us from Tufts University. Me. Thank you very much.
And earlier, you saw some clips from my documentary, Notes from North Korea. To see the whole film, go to our website, amanpour.com. You can watch the New York Philharmonic Orchestra's historic visit to Pyongyang and what many had hoped would be the North Korean version of ping pong diplomacy. And we'd like to know what you think about North Korea. So go to amanpour.com slash Facebook and tell us whether or not you think that more sanctions would slow Pyongyang's nuclear buildup. That's it for now. We'll be back tomorrow with a fascinating interview with top NATO advisor, a woman who has first-hand knowledge of life in the Taliban heartline. Meantime, catch our daily podcast on amanpour.com slash podcast. For now, goodbye from New York.